Yeah, you doing? And back together. Yeah, it is new. Okay, we've got some people in the room, which is great. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name's Mark Boyd. I use the pronouns he and him, and I'll be your moderator uh, for today. And we've got the crew from Sincedia, Gibson, Felipe, and Claudio here with us. Um, the So to, just the, a little bit about our talk today. Please, if you've got a question for any of our speakers, please um, add it to the chat. Um, and we'll make sure that we uh, answer it. Um, we've already had a few questions come in uh, from from uh, from people who've when they were signing up for this uh, for uh, for this roundtable. Um, let me just pull up my the the questions that we've had. Um, so the first one I'm going to ask Felipe. Um, so people were asking how micro does a microservice have to be? So, Felipe, do you want to introduce what your role is at Sensedia and then talk about um, the role of microservices and the size of microservices? Sure. Uh, well, um, I'm the lead software architect for Sensedia today, and essentially my main role is to help our customers in their digital journeys, especially on microservice and API world, okay? And about the question mark, and this is the first tricky one in the microservices, uh, around microservices. And actually, uh, there, there, there are many materials around uh, the topic, but the, the word micro is not that good, right? Because some people are misunderstanding the word micro, your microservice needs to be 100 lines, for example, and this is not a good idea. And that really depends on the business. Uh, a good thing to have is uh, a common framework to define this word and a common framework to check if the business is uh, running accordingly. So for example, if your domains are breaking accordingly and your microservices are referencing those domains and your scalability is smoothly in a horizontal way, so you are breaking your microservices in a correct way. So this is this is the the overall idea. Of course, we can spend all the time talking about the, the strategies to break microservices, but in a general overview, this is a good strategy to start in your microservice strategy. And there's no shame to start in a determined way and do a step back and redoing some job and redoing some microservices that are too little or too long to adapt in your business and to check the scalability. The word here is to check if your business and scalability are running smoothly. This is the, the base check that I mentioned to, to, to see if, if you're in the right way, for example. Okay, cool. That's a really useful insight. Let's come back to that. Let's put that in context in a second. I want to ask Gibson then about um, when you're, so you you work with businesses around, um, you know, does it, looking at their overall architecture at the moment and then, you know, how they will break it down. What, what's, how do you work with the business and the technical side together in order to map what the, like, you know, for a line of business, for example, to map what all of those sorts of functionalities are. So you get to that point that Felipe has just described as far as saying, this is a discrete microservice, this is a discrete, you know, how do you bring the business and the tech together so that they, they can do that mapping? That, that's actually a great question, Mark, to ask. Uh, and is the biggest challenge we've ever seen, you know, because traditionally speaking, business looks after business and technology after technology so we have the business and we 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 could go even further we have the ops teams as well so there's someone that comes with an idea someone that implements that idea and someone that looks after that, that thing when it becomes something tangible right so this is a, a very interesting challenge that we've been we've been constantly facing uh so it's a bit of a change in the mindset first to make business understand that business and, and IT and technology work together because at the end it's technology enabling their businesses. So whatever ideas that they have, it could be a new product or a new way to connect to a partner. You, have, you make them understand that what they're trying to achieve, they will only be able to achieve that through technology. So what we've been doing a lot is 
bringing these two together to a room. We have some concepts, for instance, uh, Philippe mentioned we could spend hours and hours uh, discussing here, but we have something called event storming, which, you know, it's an idea that first you bring people together, you make people understand or expose the ideas that they are having. And then you, you know, from a technical standpoint, you start figuring out, okay, what exactly do you want? What are you trying to achieve here? And then you start designing your microservice, for example. Uh, the, main, the main goal is then to group together those functionalities that are, let's say, related. And Felipe mentioned something very interesting there. Uh, there's no right or, or wrong in the size of the micro, right? So it's not like 100 lines of code, code or two operations only. It's actually something that makes sense from a business standpoint. So you can have something like order management as one big microservice because you are still learning how to do it. And you're going to have one microservice that performs a business functionality, technically speaking. And you have groups of operations there. And then when you start being more mature in your uh, microservices journey, you are then going to start splitting because now you understand that the creation of an order itself could be a microservice. And then you're going to tell the business that they now have one functionality that all together it's a microservice that is the creation of an order, for example, or the process of a payment if you're talking about banking, right? Right, cool. And then thanks. And then Claudio, then also on this question, then so you can you describe your role, your technical lead, but so then when you're working with um, engineers and they're starting to build their microservices, how do you encourage them to go back to that, like um, the event storming or the idea storming that has been done with the bit? How do you get them to connect it back to understanding the business side of it as well? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I think the important part in this discussion, Mark, is about DDD. DDD, I mean, is the core of the thing, you know. Maybe you can connect developers to the, bus to the business using DDD, domain-driven design, I think. It's a very good option to encourage developers to understand business, I think. Because some parts of developer are so technical, you know, I, mean, I have so problems with performance, turning, uh, this kind of thing. No, you you should uh, deliver business, not technical stuff, you know. Uh, maybe I think uh, the, the domain driven design help us to encourage developers to understand uh, business a little bit more, you know. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so it is that. So, so this is the opposite. So we, from what Felipe is saying, it's like not just about um so there is a business logic that's involved in designing the microservices rather than any rule of thumb about the particular size but then even when you're trying to first of all define what that is in a domain driven design then it comes back to what's the business value what's the business purpose of the microservice yeah there, there, there's one thing to mention here mark uh when we say developed for business and not for non-functional requirements right uh we, we we can go down that route but i'm pretty sure that we need another hour or so or even more which is service mesh it's the you know the next level of maturity when it comes to implementing microservices it's where you you remove all the non-functional requirements so claudio was mentioning i have performance issues i have network issues i have you know all sorts of security issues that depending on the way that the company is structured, those non-functional requirements will have to be implemented within your microservice or in a separate microservice that will serve all of these non-functional requirements. Then when we talk about service mesh, you basically extract this layer of complexity. You put this on somewhere that it's basically going to be fully centralized. And then your developers will basically have to understand business because they will have to implement business logic and not only technical uh, validations, constraints, and logics, you know? Yeah, and I think important part, uh, Gibson, this part that about service mesh handle, it's very hard to achieve, I mean, in developer. 
it's a very hard knowledge you need to to have to to implement it you know network issues is very hard to implement maybe yeah. service mesh can help you can help you it's a very good option i think yeah and always uh, we'll be regretting the development team to the business like claudio said everything is around the business itself and everything will be throughout the business because your company needs to make money and the only way to make money is achieving it, new digital products, MVPs, new launches and everything throughout your platform. So your platform and no functional requirements uh, are a priority, yes, but the tooling will help you. So bring your focus in terms of microservice and API strategy, of course, bring the focus to the business first and then moving forward to the more technical stuff and you can move in small steps. I mean, there's no shame in, for example, in an order perspective, you can break down even more a microservice. This is not a problem because your tooling will be made and well-made, uh, mm -hmm. although your business is clear. Okay, you're scaling, you're attending your business properly. This is the main, the main concern around this strategy. Right, it's sort of like, a, it's, it's a good rule of thumb to be able to avoid getting overly complex unnecessarily you know, sort of thing, isn't it? What about, so then someone else has been asking, do all microservices expose APIs? And are those APIs considered internal or external APIs, I guess? Okay, that, that, that's a good one. You should guys allow me to take this, especially when, when we are talking about all of these open initiatives, right? We have open banking, open finance. We have some countries talking about open insurance, uh, open, X, open everything, right? Microservices, they will, occasionally all of them will have uh, an API. The, the main difference is if this API is, in, is in either internal or external, right? And if we can set the scene here a bit. So when we talk about external APIs, we're talking basically about North and South communication, right? So APIs that are exposed to the external world. The external world could still be uh, if you think about a big corporation, it could be uh, one business unit using services from another one. But then when you talk about internal communication, so if you're inside your own cluster, your own business unit, your service will still communicate, but then they don't need an external API because they're all inside the same context. So yes, all the APIs, all the, the microservices will expose APIs, but none of them will be opened. Right. So you, you, you may have then internal APIs only, and then it could have uh, REST API, or when we are talking you know, about microservices, you can have gRPC, for example. And then if you're thinking about exposing those services to the external world or to a business unit, to a partner, then you will have APIs exposed. And then those APIs, we're talking about those more business APIs exposed through an API gateway, for example. And, and, and about the design, Mark, uh, well, you can design your APIs to be external APIs for the usage in the future. This is natural. Um, and of course, with the service mesh and with an API gateway and the proper tooling, you can just expose in the right way, internal and external APIs in a natural way. So it's going to be eventually one internal API can become external depending again on the business, of course, but naturally, your microservice will need to expose data throughout some sort of API, synchronous or asynchronous events, REST APIs, GraphQL, gRPC, whatever. Uh, but again, suit the microservice needs to the business needs and do not start with over-engineering everything. Start small. Of course, this is this is the, the main idea behind the scenes. Okay, cool. The um, so then we, uh, Gibson, you mentioned uh, your yeah, open X, open everything. The so you know, in um, I know your uh, I know Sincedia, I mean, it's a global operation, but that you do have a number of Brazilian um, uh, customers, and uh, I know that there's the open insurance happening in Brazil at the moment, which is leading part of the world. We've been talking about open banking this morning. How does mm -hmm. how do companies leverage microservices for those sorts of new open uh, market opportunities? Yeah, I, th I think that microservices play a, a very important and key role in this openness. 
uh, you know, Philip was mentioning there, you will expose your APIs, right? So that's that's the idea that you become open and that you, you connect those to the world. But then having a very mature layer of services, so you could either, for example, uh, use microservices to create a brand new application. So it's a new approach that it's fully scalable, you know, or you could still, uh, if you have, that's quite common, especially when it comes to, to, to the banking sector, right? They have very old legacy applications that they want to expose. But then because of security reasons, performance reasons, they may not be able to expose those applications you know, straight away. So building a layer of microservices on top of these applications help them to protect these applications from a performance standpoint uh, and then being able to expose the APIs like, like Philip was, was mentioned before, right? So you, you create this layer, you protect your backend applications, and then you, you implement these services in a way that they have APIs that can easily be exposed to the open world. So that's one of the ways to, to bring microservices to this open world, you know? Also, I think as you saw, Microsoft uh, improves the the, uh, the agility to to delivery business. I think it, it, that is important in this part. I think uh, for sure uh, we can uh, get this this using DevOps techniques. You know, because in general, Microsoft was related to DevOps to improve their their agility to deliver service in production. I think, yeah. and I think this is very important when you talk about Microsoft. The DevOps is very important to deliver your services quickly. You know, it's very important. You should pay attention to that. Yeah, the, the investment in automation, right? So especially, for example, in open insurance, now you can build insurance on demand. For example, you're leaving your house, you're going to buy insurance for a travel, for example. So the traffic and the amount of transactions will be explode exponentially. And you need to be fast in terms of deliveries. And of course, you need to be fast in everything. So the investment in automation is never enough in terms of microservice. Uh, when your infrastructure is start to growing, your automation needs to grow at the same level. So things need to be a balance there. Yeah, and I, Felipe mentioned a, a very interesting uh, use case there uh, where you know it's actually a mix of DevOps uh, to, to make more agile, uh, agile, to make it more tangible. Um, I think that one of the nice use cases that I like to use when it comes to all of these open initiatives, and that shows the power of microservices and the APIs, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's open finance, the next step of open banking and open insurance, right? So imagine that you're, you're, you, you keep buying things with your card or your, your bank account, whatever you, you, you use to, to pay. And then your bank realizes that every year, in a particular time of the year, you used to travel to somewhere to the coast, to the beach. And then with all of this analysis, the bank can use their network of partners that all are all connected to APIs to understand your behavior and start offering you either products or services like uh, we noticed that normally during this period of the year, you are traveling to this location. We have a special insurance for you for this particular travel. And then we also have swimsuits for you, special swimsuits. Oh, because you're actually diving somewhere. You know, all of those sorts of analysis that can connect not only the open banking, open insurance, but also open retail, because you can then have a partnership with uh, the cattle, for example, you know, and start selling products as part of your banking day to day, which is just unbelievable. I love that. I can so then that actually gets to the, another question that people have asked, and it matches something that Simon was talking about this morning, and that's the um, cultural shift that's required or the internal uh, organizational mentality to be thinking about that so Gibson you've just described like a travel use case that actually you know it's like a, a customer journey that has these multiple points that draws mm -hmm. in a whole range of different microservices but it's yep. like reimagining like what the customer needs 
and where you can add value, how you can design your architecture to meet those. That's a different sort of business thinking, a different sort of technical, cultural um, approach. How does, what's the shift there? How do you go about changing, you know, especially businesses that already have the pre-opening up, they've already got, you know, this is what we do, this is how we do business, this is the product we serve. How do you change that mentality? I think that, un unfortunately, the current condition we are living with the pandemic forced business to change, right? A lot. <laughs> so it's not a good situation overall for the, for the world, but somehow businesses are changing. Uh, so I think that one of the, the ways that we keep provoking our customers, especially when it comes to open banking, and they say, yes, we are fully compliant, we are following PSD2 or whatever regulation the country is, we normally ask them, are you making money with this? And then we start, you know, bringing those use cases, say, hey, you are a bank, right? So you have all of, all of this data that you can process. So if you, if, you, if you think that you can process all of this data and understand behaviors and then start creating this partnership ecosystem with fintechs, with other banks, with other financial institutions, and then power all of these initiatives with microservices, events, and APIs to enable quick connections, you know, nearly real-time responses when you try to get, give me the behavior of this customer. It's like, it's nearly instant, right? So it's where we start making these nice moves and, you know, provoking them, saying, are you really making money out of this? So then, so part of it is like the um, coming back to what the business model is and what those, what the, you know, the rev revenue generating model is. Like mm -hmm. what, what's the business case behind doing this is one thing. It, what, is there, um, so, and you've talked about a workshop type technique with um, event storming. It, what else is there? Is there, what, are, what other sort of tools have you used? And you've talked about des domain design. Uh, um, so then, uh, so then what other, tools are in your grab bag to to use with teams around uh, you know just creating that creative energy yeah so we do have some techniques to actually see business the business models canvas uh, some studies that we run inside our customers to see the business itself uh, the main driven designs and so on and we also have some technical perspective tooling so the, the API gate itself is one of those, but we do have service meshes, uh, some tooling ready-made, for example, CI CD pipelines and general CI CD pipelines use it as accelerators. So we do have a bunch of accelerators to implement in our customers to help them in the journey, during the journey, because well, it's a journey, right? It's always improving, always more, always uh, seeing frictional points to make some sort of improvements to actually increase your uh, business strategy and business revenue, for example. And we do have in the non-technical perspective tooling to reorganize your entire company. And we also have behind the scenes, the tooling to accelerate this type of transformation. So this is, of course, I can spend another half an hour saying about those yeah. tools, but well, in general, that's it. <laughs> Some companies use a kind of, I don't know if it's a, a technique or methodology, call it a platform team that provide these platforms for yes. developers to deliver applications. I mean, maybe the API gateway is inside this platform, search mesh infrastructure is, I think this is very, yeah, you know, I think it's very important. Maybe if you have a, a big company, maybe you, it's a good idea to think about these platform teams, you know, it's a very good point to, to start, yeah. I think. One thing yeah. that I always mention, think your company, uh, those platform teams, think them as servers to the rest of the company. So the developer team is just another customer for you. So mm -hmm. you have a bunch of internal customers to serve. So this is this is the main idea. Excellent. Thanks so much. There was a lot in that. Um, I see that you've all put your LinkedIn profiles in the chat. So anyone else in the audience, if you've got um, some follow-up questions or want to get in touch with the Sensedia team, please reach out um, via their LinkedIn accounts and keep the conversation going.
uh, thanks all three of you for your time today. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, 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 Bye-bye.